Did you all notice how our third graders received their Bibles today? I find it an interesting thought to ponder of how we receive God's Word. And we receive God's Word in different ways, sometimes with great excitement, sometimes with a trip or a struggle. But God's Word is still a gift to us. And so, as we've heard these words, let us consider what Paul has to say to us today. So this last week, I've been pondering this question that you see in your bulletins. What does it mean to be one? And I realized that if I were to go outside into the streets of Dallas and interview people on the streets asking this question, what does it mean to be one, with no context of our scripture passage, I would likely get a lot of different answers. And maybe some would think one, number one, first place. Or maybe some would think one, solo, party of one, alone. But this text, as we've heard it read, is not about being alone. It's not just about individuality, and it's not about being number one. An activity that I've done with youth groups over the years is to put the youth into small groups of six people and tell each person, or tell them that each person will build a square using some puzzle pieces. And they are to use all the pieces they are given. So then each person is given an envelope with these big pieces and told on go to empty out their envelope and build a square. So typically each person sets out to work using the pieces that were in their envelope. Maybe they're even racing to see who can make their square the fastest. But soon many of them get confused or frustrated, or con they're convinced that something must be wrong because they discover that it's not possible to make a square with only the pieces they were handed. Maybe there is one person in the group who's able to make a square with two triangles and sits smugly thinking, oh, thank goodness mine was so easy. I'm glad I didn't get any of those other pieces. But of course, the only way for the group to make six squares with all the pieces is to look up from their own puzzle and instead of working individually, to unite as one and work together. Pieces must be traded and shared until each person has a square in front of them. The activity cannot be completed alone. It requires each person to contribute to the group for success. All the pieces are needed to come together to build these six squares. And all of our gifts and talents and experiences are needed to come together to build up the body of Christ. So I wonder, what does Paul mean when he repeats the word one seven times in one sentence? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. We are called to be one, one body. We're called to unity. So what does it mean for us to unite as one, to collectively be one body with the one spirit and one Lord? Paul calls us to lead a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called by bearing with one another in love. G. Porter Taylor states that to bear with one another is to sacrifice for the other. It is to help carry the other's burdens. Love is not an emotion. Love is, the act, is an act of the will. So will we accept this call willingly aware that it includes sacrifice? Will we bear with one another in love and speak the truth in love? 
Our church has a history of accepting such a call. You may know that the women of First Presbyterian Church of Dallas are credited with starting what we now know as Presbyterian Children's Homes and Services. This past Wednesday, a group of church members and staff gathered together to visit two campuses, a campus in Waxahachie and one in Itasca, part of what we call PCHAS, Presbyterian Children Homes and Services, where single mothers and their children find support and housing, and where children in foster care live in safe, supportive, and loving group homes. According to our church history book, holding forth the word of life, the witness of a downtown church edited by Carol Adams, this ministry all began in 1902 when Pastor Revis traveled to a Dallas back street on a grim pastoral call to the humble home of Frank and Leontine Blaney. In a shabby room, he found the impoverished saloon worker's wife dying of tuberculosis, despondent over the fate of her unbaptized children. She feared that her husband, a good man but an alcoholic, would be unable to care for their children. She may have also been worried especially about one of her children who was disabled. Though the family was Catholic, they lived near the church and had been attending First Presbyterian. Mrs. Blaney requested of the pastor that her children be raised as Presbyterians, and Revis assured her that her children would be provided for. So elders and dare I remind us that these would have been all men at the time, traveled to the Blaney home on December 13th to participate in the baptism of the Blaney children. After Mrs. Blaney died, the father placed the children at the church in April of 1903, gave the furniture away, and the children never saw him again. He did end up dying five years later. We know that without delay, the Ladies' Foreign Missionary Society rented a house and procured a matron for the children, one of the members of the church, Mrs. Isabel Tatum. The Blaney children were the first of 27 children who found haven under the roof of the house on Annex Street over the next two years. So friends, at a time when women were not even yet installed and ordained as deacons, and certainly not as elders and pastors in the Presbyterian Church, when their gifts were not fully recognized or celebrated, these women saw a need. And they said, yes. Yes, we have gifts to share. Yes, we are one. We can come together and unite as one body. They looked at these children and said, these are our people. We belong to each other. And we may wonder, how were these women able to respond so quickly? Well, they had the organizational resources to respond quickly, and they had actually worked together for many years, and most importantly, had already explored establishing an orphanage. So today, there's a Texas historical sign in Itasca that says... After this um, initial work of the women of First Presbyterian Church, the church then decided to found a statewide orphanage for which D.S. Files' family gave the land, and the home opened in 1906. Fast forward to today, tens of thousands of children and their families have been served by Presbyterian Children's Homes and Services all beginning with a group of women who said, we can unite as one. Several years ago, I was attending an APSI conference where Presbyterian church educators had gathered, and some of you may have been there. And we heard about this word from 
the Twi language of Ghana, Sankofa. Sankofa is about looking back and looking forward. It's a word that translates to go back and get it. The proverb that's associated with it says, it is not wrong to go back for that which you have forgotten. So Sankofa symbolizes taking from the past what is good and bringing it into the present in order to make positive progress through the benevolent use of knowledge. So what have we learned from our past? Where is there goodness in our past? Where do we see God's spirit at work? And where can we bring those things into our present as we look toward the future? Where we've come with women's ministries in our denomination is one example where both men and women have spoken the truth and love and claimed women's gifts as critical to the body of Christ. And that is part of why we celebrate the gifts of women today. We recognize we haven't always done it right, but we look back and find goodness in places where women served with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. So we bring all of that into our present and look toward the future. But we have to continue doing this type of work. As I was studying this passage, I came across a question which, said, which asks, which members of the body in your church do some consider not essential? It's a good question for us to consider. We still don't get everything right. We still don't always follow what God asks of us. As we celebrate the gifts of women today, are there others who we have not fully included? Are there gifts that belong in this community that have been left out? What are we still learning from our past? What do we need to go back and get? I think to be one, for many people to come together and unite as one, we must allow people to be who they are, who God created them to be in the image of God, and to come as they are. Each of us is enough. Sometimes we think we need more, and we need more, and we need more. But the truth is, we have what we need. But we might need to share what we have with others and receive what others have to share with us. But you are enough. Your gifts are enough. One of my favorite Presbyterian pastors to follow on social media is Mary McKibben Dana. And recently, she's been using a hashtag that says, world's okayest. She recognizes that she's not always going to get it perfect or just right, but sometimes okay is all it needs to be. And so she celebrates when today everything didn't go as planned, but it was the world's okayest. So to go back to the activity I did with youth when we had all these puzzle pieces forming squares, I look at what Paul told this, the Christians in Ephesus. Each of us is given gifts by God, but none of us has all the gifts. We have enough, and what we have is meant to be shared with the body. What we have, friends, is needed. Each of us in this place has a need. Everyone outside our doors has a need, maybe an empty space. And we all have these puzzle pieces or gifts that are meant for someone else in the body to be whole. Our gift is the answer to someone else's prayer. Our gift will support or heal a need someone else has. And I recognize that 
on this Mother's Day, this is not a happy day for everyone. Mother's Day may bring grief, sadness, guilt, doubt. For some, it's a mixed bag of emotions. And for others, it may be the best day of the year. But we bring all that we are, who we are, whatever we've experienced, and that is enough. And we can be one body when we bring our whole self and offer the gifts that we have. We are given, as Paul tells us, tools to unite as one body. Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, peace, and love. Again, G. Porter Taylor says, humility keeps us grounded in the reality of who we are as creatures formed from the dust by God. Gentleness reminds us of our corporate identity. Because we are essentially part of the body, we are called to build up the body by attending to one another. Finally, we are patient because we live in time. The kingdom of God is a gift from God, not a work achieved by humans. God gives us what we need and calls us to love in action. So what does it mean to be one? Well, oneness does not come at the cost of losing who we are, and it certainly doesn't mean that we are to be the same. Our unity is a place for us to celebrate our diversity, because we all bring different things to the one body, and all of these gifts are needed. It is essential for us to bring who we are, our different gifts, our different experiences, perspectives, and offerings. And we bring these things to unite into the one body which Christ calls us to be a part. And we do all of this with humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, peace, and love. Amen. As you are able, I will invite you to stand and join me in affirming our faith using these words from a brief statement of faith. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. You may be seated. <clears throat> 